once was a clock that ran out of time. And when he ran out of time, the clock would stop ticking. And every time he stopped ticking, the clock's maker would pick him up and rewind him so he could tick again. Over and over this would happen. Time after time. Like clockwork. Every team says they're a family pet. You know, and Finney is just a different breed. It's like we say, it's a lifestyle and it's something that once you're truly a part of this family, you don't leave. You might be trying to hang up your shoes, but your heart's always here for us. It's very clear that we're always going to be a family no matter what. I mean, what does Infinity do for the gym? Thank I think it's the whole gym's inspiration. I think it's what you can be. I don't know, it's like this like cultural phenomenon with our gym. Something for like younger people to look up to, to aspire to be. Mm -hmm. It's something for us to aspire to be when we're there. Something to keep us on track. It was a huge part of my life. It's this tiny thing in this huge place. Here in El Cajon, California, the ghetto. It was a whole team of people that I looked up to. Like I went to every competition I waited for Infinity to go on. I grew up in Cheer Force looking up to Infinity. The OG OGs. David and Desmond. And David, the freaking jump rope guy. Like I knew him as the jump rope guy before I knew his name. Sit at your guys' practices or up here and just watch everything you guys did. It's something that didn't happen overnight, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that took years and years. Went through every trial and tribulation possible. And so to me, Infinity is a perfect example of life. I think that it is literally a way of life. It's, it's, it's family and it's home. But I think part of the reason I haven't been like a fuck up in life is because like cheer. There's something about it that just make, like pulls you in. It's crazy. Cheer force to me is hit or not, like you're out there on the floor with your best friends. I live with five, six of my best friends from cheerleading. And I saw all these globes and I'm like, whoa, where, like, where am I right now? Like, is this, like, am I joining, like, what team am I joining? <laughs> and then I see them practice and I've never seen something like that. It was after day one of NCAA 2014 when everybody was freaking out on Twitter. I mean, the day that it evolved full-fledged was the day that we set foot on the floor in Dallas in 2014. That's the day that Infinity changed from a good team that some people knew about to a great team that everyone knew about. Changed the cheer world. People weren't doing routines like that yet. It was kind of like a baseline routine for what cheer has turned into. People just like flipping out. Damn, this is this is the whole level that I've ever seen in cheer. It changed me as a cheerleader. I what? fell in love with it. Really? Really? Yeah. Like the one and a half threes came from the corner and the girls did cartwheels and I thought, like, why are they doing cartwheels? And then everything was like, and then everybody finished. <laughs> it was like two eight counts in the routine. Um, I'm uh, a cheer freak, but 100% cheer is, freak. Um, I started cheerleading because I wanted to learn how to do a backflip. There was a powder puff game going on in in school where the girls play football and they have boys cheerlead for uh -huh. the girls. I, having nothing to do with cheerleading whatsoever, my friend was like, you know, I have some muscles back then because I worked out. Hey, you should do this thing. You get to wear a tank top. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, okay. <laughs> the end of the 2018 season, like I was, I was in a really bad place. Uh, just like physically and mentally, like emotionally. I'm from New Jersey. Literally the complete opposite side of the fucking country. I cheered at Central Jersey All Stars and I cheered at World Cup. Now, Twisters. F5. I was on F5. Hey, world champ. 
next day after the powder belt game ended, I joined the high school cheer team. From there, I went across town and joined PCM High Desert. Coming from like a gym where their large Argo team, you know, has the most wins in their division, and to see them like constantly win all the time, I'm like damn, like I want that feeling, <laughs> but. I wasn't a girl, so I couldn't be on Shooting Stars. <laughs> My parents, they never knew anything about cheerleading whatsoever. He never wanted me to do sports in general. He was very strict. He, he, wants to be he didn't want me to stay after school, didn't want me to go outside, and I would get in trouble for skateboarding on the street. And at the time I was working at a gym, I gained like 85 pounds just because I wasn't taking care of myself because I just I didn't care anymore, you know? Yeah. And like they were just telling me, they're like, yeah, like, we've, you know, we've noticed, obviously. And he was like, you should do like a physique competition. I did that for like three months. I don't want to sound like a douche for it, but like <laughs> shredded to the bone in those three months. I had like crazy ab veins. I would just go like this, and just, you know, like yeah. I had like the weird muscles that would show that I've never seen before. <laughs> it, it, it like helped me a lot, but it didn't really like, Change like my mentality, but like I was like, all right, if I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna start doing these physique competitions, like I might as well just start going to school, you know, get my certifications for personal training. At school of Florida called Cheer Omega that came out here and was on Affinity for a year, even though I was injured for most of it. But how'd you hurt yourself? Uh, ACL tear during a run through back in October. Uh, my primary and urgent care thought I sprained it. Uh, to hear when ortho was like, nah, you you tore that. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. I stayed part of the team as like their personal cheerleader all season. <laughs> What happened? Oh. What had happened was. What had happened was, so I was walking into practice. I was not prepared. And we were the downs. I'm third. I thought I came out with them. <laughs> when was the first time you met Kenrod? So, first time I met Kenrod, I didn't even know it was Kenrod. And then when I met Kenrod, I was like, oh my god. Always like singing, like he loved to sing. <laughs> he loves to sing. I can't even turn it all the way up. He's either making jokes or he's hungry. He's <laughs> always hungry. Love country music. You always listen to country music. <laughs> Kenrod and Ted would always go to the beach in La Jolla and they would always joke around about like taking me out of school and going to the beach with me. Similar to me in a way, like ball of energy, loud, black. <laughs> I don't like to be touched. <laughs> it's not until like a little later in the season where I'm like, by the way guys, I don't like to be touched. <laughs> we watch movies and we're watching boys on Instagram. <laughs> He loves his little white boys. I'm like, I love Kenrod. You're gonna call me like, oh yeah? Like, that's all he calls me. <laughs> I started crying at practice and gave me this long speech. I should never ever cry again because it made him sad. And he said it was one of the worst things in the world for ever to see me cry. It's like, I forgot you don't like to be touched. <laughs> <laughs> Invisalign all the time. He used to just take a and put him on the floor. And I'd always step on them, and I'm like, bro, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, my bare foot just stepped on your slimy little invisible. Well, are you cheap? Was it this Because of <laughs> Black guy sitting there with like some red pants on, a white striped shirt with like some brown little dress shoes. The red, like, burgundy pants were cuffed up. And he had his glasses on, and it was like, oh, okay. He was just, oh my god, I can't run. He loves you, Tom. He really had a home there and people that he loved and he loved his job and we would always talk about like what it was like here compared to what it was like at the gym back home and Kate and Bennett just always talked about it. that's all I talked about was infinity 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 like you guys don't understand how amazing it is now that like it's just family you know like he, he used to just butter up infinity and cheer for so much to us we always kind of joked about like I don't know, maybe we should just go out there and do it. Like, it, But it was never really a serious thing. I didn't never really think it was gonna happen. It wasn't like a plan, but it was definitely a thought. Like, you know, like let's go down the cheer force and cheer at infinity. Again, trying to balance between going back out to California to cheer, or do I want to finally like take a step back and just look at something acting and stuff. The camera, I took my mom, and I called I was like, I'm gonna do it, I'm in. And, and then I told him, and so I said I told him, he kind of looked at, uh, he looked at me and he was like, okay, we're gonna do it. He was in on it too? Yeah. He was basically just waiting for me to make a decision because he wanted to go. He wanted to be pushed, obviously. He wanted to go spend a year and go be, you know, go, go on, a, on a kick butt team like that. You know, who wouldn't want to? And so he did it. How did Cocky end up coming down? He um, 
drove, I think Kenrod's car went, Kenrod drove the moving truck or whatever. Okay. Uh, yeah, around this time, Kenrod was living with me. He was like, hey, like, I need your help. Like, I'll pay for, literally, I'll pay for all your stuff. Cause like, I just need your help to have me move down cause we have to drive. And I was like, sure. I was like, if I can go work off, you know, like I'll definitely, you know, come help you. you know, I'll just take like a little break off of everything. Like yeah, use it as a vacation. Mental break. Yeah, mental break. And my only intentions coming down were just, I'm just using us this as a little vacation. So I'm going back home, starting school, and then I'm, I'm gonna do my thing. Right out of U-Haul, we like moved him down here. Like we got all the way down here. He was like, well, if you're gonna be down here anyways, why not just try a practice? Like I doubt they'll care. It's like, it's just a practice. Like what else are you gonna do? Just sit there and watch? Like why just watch when you can do it? I was kind of just like, screw cheer. And then he came to a practice. Went into a practice, and I mean, it was awkward. I didn't really know any, anybody, and people are kind of assholes here, you know, just, <laughs> they just keep their own space with their own little cliques, and they just be like, oh, a new guy, you know? After that one practice, I just completely fell in love with it. I got to where Kane and Bennett and Ken Roll dropped me off at the airport. And like, we said our goodbyes, and I just got through security, and I'm just kind of just sitting there in the gate waiting for my flight. And all of a sudden, just, ding, I get a text from Brendan. But I was like, they really want me on this team. I was like, I fucking suck. All the stunts I ever did, didn't hit. Like I threw a standing full and that was literally about the most advanced I did. Why would they even want me on this team? When I did that practice, I loved it. Yeah, I just like, it gave me that feeling of like happiness again. You know? Satisfaction. Like, like that one thing I was missing. My mom's my best friend. Like if I have anything like I need help with or I'm not sure about, like she's the one I go to. Sent her a screenshot of what Brendan said. I was like, this is what they're saying. And I was like, what should I do? I was like, should I actually do this? I was like, can I even do this? <laughs> and my mom was like, if something brings you happiness, go with that. Go with it. Yeah. She was like, especially in the situation you are right now with yourself, like getting to a place where you're happy is the best thing you can do for yourself. Mm -hmm. Do it. And I was just like, fuck, okay. <laughs> Texted Brendan. I was like, when do I need to be down? He was like, two weeks. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> I'm like, I gotta change my entire life in two weeks. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll be down there in two weeks. I sold my totaled um, Volkswagen combined some money that I saved over the summer. 10,000% of my mind was focused get a car, get to San Diego. Literally, those two things, not thinking about anything else. I had spent all my money on the car. I pulled up to San Diego with zero dollars. I condensed my entire life into like those three plastic drawers, you know? Um, and then, you know, I hit the road. So I was planning on going back to St. Louis and I already quit all my jobs here. And I told my mom at Worlds that I was coming home. After 2018? Yeah, and then... What made you stay? Brendan. I found out Brendan was going to coach Infinity. One of the hardest transitions of my life. What was? Becoming a head coach for Infinity for the first year. So the people that we wine and dine with, the people that we go to the beach with, the movies with, as their coach, it's my job to know how to separate business or personal. I would make plans with some of them and then they would condition too much for mistakes and then we wouldn't have plans anymore after that. <laughs> you know, it was hard for me to learn how to give direction without tension. And so it took it took a while. I wasn't going to cheer this year. I had tried out a different gym, made a team, went there for a practice, decided it wasn't for me, and wasn't going to cheer my senior year of high school. And then I got a text from Brendan and came in for one practice, and I fell in love immediately. As soon as I pulled up to San Diego, my head gasket blew. I had no car, no money, and then it's like, well, shit. Funny story is nobody even knew that I was coming to San Diego, Casey Popper or anybody, you know. Did you have a place to stay? I was actually in contact with Casey Esparza, and then he was like, yeah, dude, do it. Come on, come move. Let's go. You, you know what I'm saying? You need to tell nobody before, like, you yeah. made the team. And I assumed that he was talking to Casey Pop this whole time, because he was like, yeah, just pull up, bro. Like, you can come stay here. <laughs> Wait, what? So here's what happened. I was like, Samson, you need to talk to Casey. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to talk to him for you. I specifically said, Samson, like, talk to him. So I pulled up, no car, no money, after I blew my head gasket, and I'm just staying down there looking for a job and everything. All of a sudden, Caleb, who's, who's living there too, tells me, you know Casey Pop, like, had no idea that, that you were here or coming, right? Wait, what? And he was like, yeah, Samson's been downstairs, it's going on like three weeks now. Because yeah. <laughs> I was like, dude, does Casey know you're here? Like, have you talked to him? Because people were telling me that Casey didn't know. And this whole time I'm like, dude, what? 
head. Because everyone was getting on my head. And I was like, Samson, dude, like, you're gonna get me in trouble? Like, please, God, tell Casey. What the hell, Casey Esparza? Like, I thought you were talking to Casey Pop. But now I know better, you know, about communication. Dude, it was all that. <laughs> like, Casey, obviously, because he's chill. He didn't, like, kick him out or anything yeah. like that, but, like... And then it was just a huge fucking struggle bus from that very first day that I bought that car and condensed my life and came out here, you know? I was traveling back and forth all summer, driving from Arizona to California. We were looking for roommates, and then Caden Bennett had put me, Christian, Kenrod, and Caden Thompson in a group chat. We all found a place in Santee Park One. Worst apartment complex ever. Don't ever move there. It was me and Kenrod, Austin, Christian, and Caden and then Christian's dog Cosmo. Me and Ken Rod were sharing a room and then Kaden had his own. Because he's picky like that. It felt like we were just back home in Utah. Because uh -huh. I just, you know, I had, I, had, yeah, I had those two I think That was awesome. Like we used to always, like when we were home, we always used to like pester him. Like pretty much I was just the straight boy on the team. Kaden Bennett and Ken Rod, they're just, they're the ones who they'll just pick and they'll just attack. <laughs> and I was, I was just the one they picked and they just, they just messed with me all the time. Come over and hang out with us. And be like, no, like I'm in bed. And we'd always like bribe them with like food. They dragged me along everywhere they went, all the competitions. Like they always, yo Kaden, come with us, you know? And yeah, that's kind of just where our friendship started. This trifecta of Kaden, Kaden, and Kenrod. They spoke in code. DiGiorno, Topanga. <laughs> awesome to like have us all together and we just go and shoot the shit and go get food. I just felt like we were back home. So, yeah, that's how, that's how he ended up down here. I was sleeping in Casey Pop's garage. I got a call at four in the morning from my dad. He said, I have something to tell you. And then he said, your brother is dead. You know, I still had 0.1% of hope that, that he was being resuscitated at that moment or attempted to be resuscitated. I couldn't finish my sentence, you know, but before I could finish something, he said, your brother is dead, like, again, to lock it in for me. Yeah. My brother, he had went to jail. He was involved in a DUI incident where he crashed with another vehicle. He had gotten out of jail. Two weeks later, he came out and, you know, a similar situation happened. And I wanted to call him, you know, just because, but I didn't. I was too worried about my car, worried about a lot of things. I don't have any money. I need to figure out how to pay rent to Casey Pop. I was looking at the huge tier bill and everything. I really thought $40 is too much to go see my family, you know? And he said the sheriff just came to my door. I could hear my mom crying in the background. And um, the phone call was only about 15 to 30 seconds long. He didn't say anything about coming home or anything. I just, but yeah, so he said, your brother is dead. And he left me to figure out what I was about to do after that. But I said, you know, okay. And then we hung up by the nanosecond. Felt fucking wrong. That time was still moving and that something like that really happened. There was some moments of silence, wondering what the fuck I'm gonna do because I have practice later today and I'm here in San Diego with no car. You know? Stress, it's Palm Springs. Spirit sports every year for infinity kind of tends to feel the same. So we just go cram and cram and cram, practice, practice, practice. We had every up and down you can think of. Injury, then the next thing would be a fight. The next thing would be somebody quit. The next thing would be a fight. It would be an injury, then somebody would quit. The week before it was definitely stressful. So Palm Springs was my first competition on Infinity. Mm -hmm. Like two weeks before I joined the team. But yeah, I remember I was scared as yeah, I was nervous as hell. But I'm, I'm always the most nervous at Palm Springs anyway. Probably the most nervous I am at a competition is Palm Springs. More than Worlds, more than NCAA. Yeah, thank you. Damn. Like, I miss this toss extension. <laughs> like, everyone doing full ups. So that was, I was like really nervous about that, but yeah. He knew that if I saw him being nervous, like I would get nervous too. So he would try to just like act calm. He's fine, like, he's okay with that. <laughs> Dude, he's so cute. <laughs> I remember, I could tell he was like nervous about it. It was a really good stunting week for us. Yeah, we got pretty excited sometimes because it was just like, damn, he was like, we're getting that bid. <laughs> I don't know if it was Marshall or Christian that got taken out of tumbling. Christian landed on Kenrod. 
Or it might have been Marshall. Doing two to double, and then I was on the floor, my ass touched the back of my head, <laughs> and I was out. <laughs> I, I hit a brick wall. He did not even flinch. And when that happened, Christian got hurt. You could tell that they were like frustrated. Not even like Kenron. Kenron was just like, what do you guys want me to do? Like, what do you want me to fix? Like sometimes I could tell he was like frustrated, but he wouldn't like say anything. But he'd just be like, oh, Kevin, would, Kevin would get frustrated. Yeah, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin would get frustrated over a drop of a freaking dime. And like people would get like frustrated because it's like the day before like our one of our biggest comps. D one. D one. Yeah, yeah, it's just a normal comp day, I guess. Normal routine: waking up, coaching, being nagged on by Anna. Those <laughs> things, you know, dealing with kids. Pretty confident, like we were all just being our usual selves, like funny, joking around before you know going backstage and everything. So it was all just like pretty, a pretty mellow day, normal day of the like the week. Anyway. You you screw around until you gotta get serious, really. Had a couple mess ups, um, but they weren't bad. Like it wasn't a bad first day, yeah. especially for just doing starting pullouts like the week of. I felt like we did really good, but it was still definitely a fucking push. Saturday, I fell out of face type. I dropped Kendall that competition. That happened. <laughs> Went through the whole fun and got the floor. We were like, dude, no worries. We're going to have it tomorrow. It's going to all be good tomorrow. After we performed, it was like everything was okay. And I hadn't seen him like all day except for when we competed and just before and just after. Then I looked over and he was sitting like right off the side of the judges' are with Celeste and Aaliyah, or someone? Me, Kyle, Celeste, and Kendra. I hung out with Kendall, I hung out with Kyle, there's a few people who just come in and out. I just ended up sitting in the back of an arena and watching teams. During that time, I did get to talk with him about how I was feeling in regards to being injured, how I felt like I didn't know if I could continue with Infinity for the rest of the season with going to competitions and stuff. He was like, I want you here, we want you here, you're part of this family, you started this journey with us already. And one of the reasons why he offered to take me home was to help out with my family. That he's like, I know this is not plan not that big, but do you want to ride home? I was texting him right there and I was like, I could just get up there and go over and talk to him. I was like, no, I'm just going to sit here and whatever. And, uh, yeah. Earlier that day, Ken Rod told me, you know, I'm celebrating my birthday with my mom and mm -hmm. you can totally stay with us. I don't want you driving. Like, I appreciate that so much for offering, but I have to go home and get some yeah. stuff. So Anna was like, you should stay, you should stay. Like, you shouldn't drive home. Like, you know, the weather's going to be bad. Of course I accepted it because he was super persistent. He was like, I'll take you home. You're fine. Bad weather when we finally left the convention center. But on our way out, he made it a point to stop and talk to a lot of Chinfluous families and kids. Kids he had never met before. Kids from other locations just to say they did a good job. And while walking out of convention center, he was talking about how coming to Chinfluous was a big change for him because he felt like family he admired the coaches and the gym owners here. How they treated their athletes and how the athletes treated them back with respect. Then we got in this car and talked about music, life, his family. He was really concerned about his family and his mom driving through Hemet from Hemet to work every day. It was really odd, the type of conversations we had. It wasn't something you'd normally talk about if you're tired after a long day of cheer. He was just really wistful about everything. Wistful, was <laughs> Kind of like deep in thought. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just like the really surface level things of cheer. Um, and even before when he was talking about cheer, he was talking about connection, relationships, family, just the bond between coach and athlete. It was super deep. It wasn't just surface level mm -hmm. cheer is fun. I love that shit. That moment was just felt really personal and really, like, I really bonded with him at that moment. And it just, everything was peaceful and calm. We got mm -hmm. to my hotel, which was in Palm Desert. We drove from Palm Springs to Palm Desert, and he said his home was in heaven. And he was on the way later. That it really was not. <laughs> Isn't that it's, the opposite direction? It's in the opposite direction. And he knew before he left the convention center, oh, yeah, that's on the way. Total lies. <laughs> Total lies. <laughs> <laughs> when he got me off from my hotel, my parents were out, were out at dinner. I was just coming back to my empty hotel room. He dropped me off in the front. We didn't get a chance to take pictures earlier that day because everyone else did. I told him I wanted to get my uniform on tomorrow so we can take some pictures together. And I'll actually have my hair done and makeup done. And he said, yeah, we'll definitely do that. I said, I'll see you tomorrow. Gave him a hug and that was it. Later, I was in warm-ups with Frenzy, and I looked down and I saw his name scrolling across my phone, and 
just thought to myself, you know, like I'm in warm ups, I, Ian's not there to take over for me, and he was probably just calling to ask me where we were, or what time frenzy was going on, or could he come back to warm ups. I just thought to myself, I can't answer right now. Continued counting, and I looked down again, and his name was still going across my phone, so I just decided to pick up. You get that, you get that <laughs> text from Anna, right? That text in the group meet, everyone meets. Yeah, yeah. She was like, come back to the convention center. I had thought Anna called me to come in and work our couple in. <laughs> so. Seems pretty serious, you know, like maybe someone got injured or, you know, kids don't seem stupid. Someone broke their ankle, going to replace them. Yeah, you know. Some of them asked if they should bring practice clothes. They thought that we got score sheets and we wanted to practice. Steph was like, "Do we need to bring cheer shoes?" Like, we know how Infinity is. We knew <laughs> we about to be practicing. It's a good ride. And right away, Santa sees like, "Dude, what if someone died?" And I'm like, "Come on, Santa, like, shut up." You know, like yeah, dead ass. Like, yeah. I was like, "That's like nerd as fuck." Like, don't be saying shit. Like, Anna called me like when I was still a little further away from home and. She was like, are you are you almost home? Like, I'm about 20 minutes. And she was like, you need to call me when you get home. And like, please drive safe. And I said, what's going on, Ken Rod? I'm in warm-ups right now with Frenzy. And he sounded frantic. And he just said, Anna, I was in a car accident. And I said, are you OK? Well, my car's a mess. My car's messed up. It doesn't, it won't, I can't move it. But are you OK? Yes, it's just my hand. And I said, okay, calm down, and are the cops there? And he said, no, he said it was a hit and run. So I told him to get in the crew and let them know that he had been in a car accident. And I told him, I said, they'll come and, and get you and help you out with everything. And he said, I'll figure it out. And, and I said, are you okay? And he said, yes. I told him I loved him, we hung up the phone. As always, I jumped in the group me before he could and let them know that Kenrod had been in a car accident and he was fine, but he needed help and that somebody needed to go get him. After that, I finished warm-ups with, with Frenzy and started getting a couple phone calls about, did he say where he was? He's not answering his phone. I tried to call his phone like, I don't even know how many times I called his phone. And just like nothing, 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 nothing. I was calling him, texting him, just repeatedly. I just had seen texts that he wasn't answering his phone, but then there wasn't much after that. So I figured they had found where the car accident was and they were probably just getting things handled. I didn't really think too much about it because he had told me that he was okay. And um, I had texted him and I, I said, I love you and everything is gonna be okay. Just breathe. And that his family was on his way. After that, I knew that some of the kids had taken off to go and find where the car accident was. He might need someone to go like pick him up or help him or whatever. We were just kind of waiting to see like what happened to see if like Celeste got a hold of yeah. him and they were going back to help him or what. And I like had texted him and I was like, hey, I just told me an accident. Like, are you okay? Is your car okay or whatnot? And he didn't respond. And he's never really been like great at responding or like, anyways. I always used to have to like pester and call him and then he'll finally be like, what? Do you want? <laughs> he'll always like, well, I'm gonna see you in like a couple minutes anyway, so it's like pointless. I just thought he was being him. Oh, like, Kenny, I'm like, are you good? Are you good? Do you have to, do we need to come get you? Do we need to send someone to come get you? I thought he was fine, so I wanted to stay and watch whatever team we were there to watch and... I got a call from his phone, expecting to hear his voice to say, I'm okay. And I got a call and it was a woman's voice with a very heavy accent saying, I found this phone on the side of the road. I was like, yeah, some lady picked up his phone and was like, yeah, he's here. He's like laying next to his car. Then my response to that was, have you called 911? Is he alive? Is it, is, is it Ken Rod? In my head, I'm like, what does that mean? What I told myself is like, he's probably just like, in, like having a, like a panic moment. He's maybe relaxing, he's just like relaxing, yeah. trying to lay down, or maybe he's a little bit hurt somewhere. So he's like trying to like take a second, you know? And she said, um, I called 911, I called 911. Who is this? Who is this? Who is this? Then it just, the, the line just went silent, and then the phone hung up, and that's when I knew something, something was wrong. He just said he was fine, so I don't think there's anything to worry about. So I like was trying to calm myself down, so we went and we hopped in the car and like pulled up like to accidents that were nearby. Um, and then my parents had just come home after I got that phone call, maybe five minutes later, and we jumped in the car to go see if we could find him. We called four or five different emergency rooms. And then I remember that he was talking about how his mom used to drive through the mountains to Hannah, so we decided why not check there in case 
least that's where he went. Like 10 minutes after we had left, we went to turn down the road and it was closed. And at the end of the road closure, there was an accident. And so I started freaking out because I was like, well, I know the only reason that they like block off roads is if it's like really, really bad. And, I, and then it turned up not even being like his, his accident. accident. So I was like, okay, we're good. And we finally found his car. And his car was a wreck. But he wasn't there, so we got out and... It was definitely a undrivable. Right, freezing. It was butt ass cold. Freezing outside. outside. Like, ran up to the officer and I was like, is this uh, like a blue Subaru with you tell place? He's like, yeah. And I was like, this is my friend's car. He just got in an accident. We're just trying to find out what hospital they took him to. He started like asking Brendan and I all these questions. Like, I don't even remember what he was asking me, but it felt like, I felt like I was in trouble or something. But, or he just called our coach and was like, he was fine, just had a burn in his hand. He was like, wait, what? He was like, he called your coach. Like, yeah, he had just called her like, um, not longer than an hour ago, I think. And he was like, well, this is the hospital they took him to. It's the hospital and walked into the ER, went up to the desk. And I was like, hi, my friend's here. Um, he was in an accident and I guess they brought him here, whatever. So she didn't skip a beat. She was like, yep, yeah, just down the hall. So we buzzed Brent and I back and it was like this long ass hallway. And I was I was literally just waiting as we like walked by every single room was empty. I'm like, what is he? How casual everybody was makes me so mad. We were literally waiting to just walk in and like crack jokes about him, like not answering his phone. Like I remember one time I went to the ER because I thought I was gonna have to have my appendix taken out. And the whole time we were in the ER, he was just like cracking jokes, and I was like laughing, but like trying like not. We're going in the hallway. Down this hallway. And every single room's empty. We're passing beds. And because of the person I am, I make a joke. I swear to God, if he has a burned hand and that is it, and he did not call us back, the second I see him, I'm gonna punch him in the face. There's this guy at the end of the hallway that's like signaling to come into this room. So I turn the corner and his mom and dad are sitting there. I remember being in the coach's hospitality room and we were just waiting for our score sheets and I was up at the top. Brennan had called me, picked up the phone, and I was expecting him to just tell me that maybe Kenrod's hand was pretty scraped up and that we might have to make a few adjustments or, you know, just that they were getting the car towed and they'd be back at the hotel soon. But when I picked up, I could barely understand Brendan and I just remember him saying, Mommy's gone. And I said, what? And he said, he's gone, Ken Rod's gone. And I said, I don't understand what you're saying, Brent. So I talked to him and he told me it was just his hand, but he's fine. And he said, no, he's gone, he didn't make it. Ken Rod died and I said, Brent, are you sure? And he said, mom, he's gone. I remember the look on Anna's face. I will never forget the look on her face. I instinctively got up and walked to the back of the room, and I think just because we all saw the panic in her face, we followed her. I heard her say, what, what, I don't understand. He was fine, he was fine. It was like a terror in her face, and I knew in that moment, and I, I, I needed her to confirm it, so I kept saying, Anna, please, what happened, what happened? And she looked up and said, he's gone. Wait, what? You, every, we just talked to him. In that moment, it, it made no sense. She had just talked to him. She had just talked to him. He had just told her he was fine. So in my mind, it's no, that something's wrong. You're, you're not hearing it right. It's loud in here, you know. Let's go out to the hallway. That it, and in that moment, Karen Wilson walked in and she saw my face and came over and said, what's wrong? And I said, we just lost an athlete. They grabbed our entire staff and led us down the hallway to a private room. There started the craziness of that very long night. My mom and I drove back to a house that me and a few other blackout and rap girls were staying at. I was giving Savannah a bath that night. Taking out her makeup and getting ready for bed. A third of the way through the mountains, because it's a very long path through. I got a text. So I was eating pizza with Samson, right? Just watered down the snow. We went to Panda Express to go eat. Yeah, I was like pulling into the driveway. Called her again, because I just, I knew something wasn't right, and I was like, I just need you to tell me what's going on. And 
my mom just like ran outside and then she's on the phone and I had already like changed into my PJs because I was feeling really tired. I think my back was hurting really bad so I was ready to go to bed. We're laying in bed and I checked my phone and Jen texted the group. I mean I kind of like, I kind of felt this like little thing like I'm like oh shit like hopefully he's okay you know. I left my phone like on the bed in the hotel room and I was giving her a bath. I did not know I had Missed calls from like Nicole, Jen, Anna. Looked at me and she was like, I have a really bad feeling about this. I have never seen her like run out like that before, so I knew something was wrong. It was Eric, Christian, Sal, Christine, Casey Pop were standing outside laughing, having a good time, whatever. And I walked in the team room, literally 10 seconds, like grabbed my backpack, came back out. I like went out there and I was like, like what happened? Kenmore got in a car accident. I, yeah, I heard that like in the group meeting and she's like, we need to go to the convention center. And I thought that like he would like be at the convention center and like maybe he like, like broke an arm or something, you know? And we were just going to see him. Me, Kaden, Ted, and Caleb have went to Ruby's Diners. Like Anastasia and a bunch of blackout people were there too. And we just walked in that place and we sat down and then we ordered our food. As soon as we ordered our food, I get a call from fucking Eric. And I was like, what's up, Eric? Sounding weird on the phone, like not saying much, just like saying, you need to get here, you need to get here. And I was like, well, what the fuck is going on? You need to get here, you need to get here. I was like, well, what's going on, bro? Like, I need to know before I just start running over there. Like, we just ordered our food, like we just sat down. I was like, did someone die? Someone in the hospital? And he like, paused. Can't, like, this is not something that you can say over the phone. You just need to get here. And I was like, oh my God, okay. And I was freaking out. We were all freaking out. We got our food to go. And then we ran to the fucking We were just running in the rain, like super puddles. We're just in the puddles. You guys ran to the convention center? I had a feeling that something terrible had happened. I didn't know if it was due to my negative expectation or what, but me and Casey had talked about that, and then she texts again, like, you guys, you know, like, everyone needs to meet, like, everyone's active, so I'm like, well, we get our pizza to go. And I guess there was a worker there who knew, and it was like, she was like, cheer for us, room right down the hall, and we were like, okay, and we were just booking it. And the lady goes, like, are you cheer for us? And I'm like, yeah. Like, so the room's right here, and I'm walking in, I can hear screaming, I'm like, Why is someone screaming? Why is it dead silent? Um, and I just, I remember just walking into the room and just the first person I noticed was Shade. And she was just bawling and everybody was just crying. And I just, I had, I just had no clue like what was going on. Um, and then I believe it was Jen. And Jen kind of comes up to us and we're just kind of like, like, what happened? What's what's going on? Um. I've coached for 25 years. I, you know, was the coach of Wrath when we lost Jewel, and that was absolutely horrific. Having said that, all of my athletes knew prior to the first time that we walked in and we're all together. We were, you know, less than a couple hours from the team having just taken the floor and getting ready to compete again the next day. And that reality of how do I tell these kids? I mean, you literally are telling the story over and over and over again, and you are getting everybody's first reaction over and over and over again. And you know, you have to try and just tell it and be there while people are breaking down and trying to be like strong for 14 year old girls who are literally breaking down. They cannot breathe. When in reality, you are just as confused as everybody. You have no idea what's going on. You want to crawl in a corner and be hugged yourself, you know? So that was really hard that night. It'll haunt me for the rest of my life, knowing that I had to break each athlete's heart one at a time. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. So I walked in and Nicole, um, Jen goes, oh, like, Casey, do you know? know? What? Like, know what? Do I know what? what what's going on? And I walk in, I was like... It was like the saddest moment of my life because I walked in and seeing 
all of my teammates. <laughs> Watching all of them like crying and screaming. Like, I just, I knew what happened. She was like, I didn't make it. And I was like, what? Like, I was so confused. She was like, yeah. She was like, Kenrod didn't make it. He, Kenrod passed away. I lost it all. I went outside and was just freaking out. Like, I just was speechless. I don't know, it was just crazy as fuck. We got out of the car. I was like confused the whole time, walking out fast. And then my mom's like, stop me. And she's like, oh yeah, like, Kevin kind of passed away. And I was like, like, no, no, he didn't. I was like, no, he didn't, mom. I'm like, mom, like, no, he didn't. Like, I just saw, like, I just saw him today. I mean, when me and my mom were talking about it, she'd be like, Aaliyah, you were like yelling at you to go back, believe it. Everyone was happy, and I left for five seconds, and then I came back, and everyone was just like, literally, I just felt like everyone was depressed. What the heck just happened? No one answered me at first, and I was like, what's going on? Someone literally just said, Kevin. I didn't even know what to think or what to do. Like, I literally just went numb. Like, the first thing I could think of, I was just like, how? I was like, how? Like, what do you, like, what do you mean? Like, he just texted Anna that he was fine, you know? Hey, this isn't real. Like, what do you mean? That, like, we literally just saw him. How did that happen? That doesn't make any sense. No, like, no, like, it's just, it's on, a, it's competition day. I didn't even, like, think it was a possibility. You know, when I talked to him, he was fine and he told me he was okay and that was supposed to be the way it was supposed to be. I was supposed to see him the next day. I remember being on the floor for a really long time and I just couldn't process it. Ted was at a table on the side and he was like screaming. I, I was just shaking. I couldn't stop shaking. I... My instinct at that moment was to just turn around and go back. Mm -hmm. Austin couldn't wrap his head around it at all. It doesn't make any sense. Like, he was just here. We just saw him like an hour ago. Like I just hugged him. I have to go get Gina outside of the room. As soon as I see her, I just start crying because I know that we have to tell her. I remember saying to myself like over and over, it's okay, it's okay. And then, and then you kept repeating back to me. It's okay. I can't listen I to this anymore. This, yeah. I can't watch it. I can't listen to it. I couldn't talk at all. I didn't understand what was going on. Like, I had, like, my fill of everybody breaking down, and I went outside and called my mom, and then I just fucking lost it. Because I was like, I'm literally sitting here watching every single fucking person just break down, and it's like, I'm going crazy. I'm going crazy, mom. And I'm like, really? disturbed by it. On it came like halfway down the hallway. She like held my hand. <laughs> and I remember calling Celeste and so I texted Anna, I don't think I can make it. I'm in the mountains looking for Cameron. What happened? Is everything okay? She definitely did not know yet. Celeste, you need to turn around. And she said, why? Kenrod passed away. And I can just, I can remember the sound of her voice. She just started screaming on the phone. And she said, it was my fault. It was me. Oh, he took me home. I just had to tell her, you know, that she was the lucky one. She was the one that, that, that got to talk to him last. And we have a a great conversation with and she was the one that was blessed enough to get to see him and I know that it was very hard for her but at that moment all I could think was it was my fault it was my fault that he had driven me it was my fault he had been out in the rain it was my fault he was on that road at that time and it's taken a long time to get over that but I feel very selfish thinking that it's, it's not what he would have wanted the rooms ended, and so did the hallway. The only other way to go was left, and so we did.
Ken Rod's family, his mom and his dad, his dad was so quick to say, he's gone. Caden's world turned completely upside down. Caden's a big guy. It's as if he never had kneecaps. He fell straight to the floor. He collapsed. Just waiting for somebody to say that it's a lie. Because that was his brother. His dad was a very powerful voice. And just the posture of his mom after an hour or so telling Caden and myself to get up, you know, like he's he's with God. But not being religious is very difficult to not accept those choices. Especially when they're like him. When they are so easily coachable. Are people like him that know every kid's name that comes in the gym on a Tuesday and Thursday. We didn't go and see him. Because the doctor and his parents encouraged us that he was not going to look the same. And that was around the same time that we found out what actually happened to him. Just after his car was hit. It was after his car was hit that he called Anna. He called Anna. That's his coach. He called his coach. Not just his parents, he called his coach. And then he got hit. He didn't just burn his hand, and he wasn't okay. One of us has to be nice. Don't do them for Let's go, you guys. I vote Kenrod being nice because. After we left there, we took Celeste with us. We made it back to the convention center. I did not know that's where I was walking into. Just another stab right to the heart. And of course, everybody deserved to know what exactly happened to our poor Kenny. And as I would never, ever put that on Caden to have to tell the family, I did. And I told them exactly what happened to him. To see it crush all of them again, as if, as if hearing the news enough wasn't enough. I hated that day. We all just spent hours crying and trying to sort out our feelings and understand. And we all sat in a circle and we discussed what we wanted to do for day two. No one ever expected that they would have to make that decision. And now we have to make it as like a whole Jen said that we could decide to just be done for the weekend and take the time to grieve and just be together and she said or we could take the floor and I remember a little bit of silence and finally one of the kids said that they felt that we should take the floor to honor Kenrod because it was what he wanted. And we went around the circle and we said, is anybody opposed? I just remember in the last one and I looked over at Caden Bennett. He had his head down and he looked up at me and he shook his head and he said yes. So they all agreed that they wanted to take the floor for him. There was no doubt in my mind I knew what the team was going to decide, you know. I mean, I knew they were going to go on and endure all of that because it's infinity, you know?